In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed Lord, who hast caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, today we are going to be looking at the second chapter of the second book of Kings, and it's one of the most exciting ones of all, because it will include... The one thing we all know about Elijah, that he went up to heaven in a fiery chariot. And we've all got a mental picture of that which looks something like this. <laughs> there we have from, from a children's um, life of the prophet Elijah. Or if you want something a bit more refined, maybe we could go for this. And this is, I'll just step out the way for a moment. Um, this is... The chair's not part of the art. Um, is by Giuseppe Angeli, 18th century Italian artist. Notice how Elisha is dressed rather like a Carmelite. Um, I think that's probably deliberate, as is Elisha himself in his chariot, and he's about to let his mantle fall. So, let us begin at the beginning. And it happened when the Lord was going to take Elijah to the heavens in a whirlwind that Elijah and Elisha with him went from Gilgal. There's a great sense of mystery about this whole passage. Um, and it begins you know, right in the first verse of the chapter when the Lord was going to take him in a whirlwind sometimes translated as in a storm. And we already associate storms with Elijah. Um, we know that he likes, you know, the dramatic effects, the earthquake, the wind, the fire. And so the Lord is going to lay on a spectacular departure from, for him. And he's with Elisha. Elisha we haven't seen very much of until now. We saw when he was called, when he was behind the plough and he slaughtered his oxen and burnt the plough and, and uh, said goodbye to his parents and gave a feast to his men. We'll learn later that he was a, a constant companion of Elijah and he's described this rather lovely phrase as the one who poured the water over the hands of Elijah. So he acted as his servant and he will be his successor but that isn't absolutely certain from the beginning. And Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, pray, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. There's um, an interesting um, chiastic structure to this whole journey, which means there's a kind of symmetry. If you look at the geography, I haven't got a map today, but you'll just have to believe me. The geography, they go down and down and down and down and down, and then Elijah goes up, and then Elisha goes up and up and up and up and up. So they start in Gilgal, then they'll go to Bethel, then they'll go to Jericho, and then uh, they'll end up at the Jordan, and they go right across the Jordan to the uh, Transjordania. Then uh, up goes Elijah, and afterwards Elisha comes back to the Jordan, back to Jericho, back to Bethel, and then to Carmel, and thence to Samaria. So there's a, a very beautiful um, uh, kind of V-shape uh, of the whole story. <coughs> so first of all, he says, I'm going to Bethel. And the Lord's told him to do this. And Elisha said, as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not forsake you. So here we see We've already seen something of Elisha's character, his readiness to, to come and follow at the moment that Elijah called him. And now on this occasion, he says, you're going to Bethel? I'm going to Bethel. I will not forsake you. And it's partly, I think, because he knows uh, that Elijah is going to be taken. Um, you notice um, the language again. Elijah doesn't go up into heaven. He is taken up to heaven. He is assumed, and he is a pre, uh, 
predicament of Our Lady in her assumption when she is taken up into heaven. And indeed, there are um, stories of how her mantle is given to St. Thomas the Apostle. There are two ver different versions of those legends. Um, one is that um, all the apostles are there when Our Lady is, uh, is assumed into heaven, except for Thomas, <laughs> who always happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so Our Lady appears to him later and gives her, it gives him his, uh, her mantle. And indeed, I believe there is supposed to be a, a relic of it somewhere. The other story, and perhaps this was, this was Thomas's own version of it, <laughs> is that only Thomas was there when she was assumed into heaven, and all the other apostles arrived, arrived, arrived late. And he said, here's the mantle, who's the doubter now? <laughs> Quite like that idea. But it does, it all chimes with Thomas then, of course, going to India and being um, the apostle uh, of, of India. Anyway, um, uh, Elisha clings to Elijah before he is uh, assumed into heaven. And they went down to Bethel. So they go down to Bethel. And the acolyte prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Did you know that today the Lord is about to take your master from over you? And he said, I too know. Be still. Who are these acolyte prophets? They seem to be the band of the prophets, the prophetic guild. And um, you know, great numbers of them uh, there are, as we'll see as the story unfolds. But they too, there's a kind of sense of expectation. Elijah's going to be taken away. We have a previous example of that. Uh, well, two previous examples. One is Moses that I'll talk about a little later. But um, oh, anybody know who's the first person who just disappeared? is no more? The answer is Enoch. Enoch in chapter 5 of the book of Genesis. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. You've heard of him because he's the oldest person described in the scriptures. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. You might think that's pretty good going. But in comparison with all the other people at this stage of Genesis, he's had a tragically short life. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That's what we know about him. There are some um, apocryphal writings later on about him. We won't worry about those. He's a very mysterious figure. But that beautiful expression, Enoch walked with God, just like Adam had before the fall. And so Enoch is a little sign of how if we walk with God, if we recover that intimacy with the Lord, he will take us. He just disappears. So the acolyte prophets, the band of the prophets, they say, your master's Elisha says, yes, I know, shut up. <laughs> Do you think I don't know that? I know him better than anyone. The sense of that. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, pray, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not forsake you. And they came to Jericho. There's another echo there that we see in all three of these stages going down. Jericho, the lowest city on earth, uh, nearly a mile below sea level. People go there, and they've got skin conditions because apparently um, being very low down uh, helps with that. But do you remember when Abraham is with Isaac for the binding of Isaac and they're going to go up Mount Moriah and there's a certain stage where um, Abraham says uh, to the servants um, you stay here 
with the donkey. I and the lad are going to go yonder and worship. And as Abraham and Isaac ascend Mount Moriah, and they are alone. And there's that sense that they are going to worship in a way which is not accessible to anyone else. Elijah keeps saying, you stay here. And Elisha says, no, I'm going to come with you. I too will come and worship. So they come to Jericho and the acolyte prophets who were in Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord is about to take your master from over you? And he said, I too know, be still. Very disappointing for the acolyte prophets. They thought they were the ones with the news. You know when you've got an exciting piece of news and you go and tell someone, they say, yeah, I know. It's really disappointing. And Elijah said to him, stay here, pray, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he says, and he said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not forsake you. And the two of them went. And 50 men of the acolyte prophets had gone and stood opposite at a distance. And the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. And it parted on both sides. And the two of them crossed over on the dry ground. Now there we are, we already very aware of the resonances there. Parting of the Red Sea by Moses and the parting of the Jordan uh, by Joshua. Elijah is almost going into reverse. He's coming to the end of his life and it's, he's going back to God and so he actually leaves the promised land at this point. Um, and there's a really important connection there because at the end of Moses' life, he does not enter the promised land. But he's actually very near where Elijah is now. He's on Mount Nebo and he sees the promised land. And then God himself buries him. And his grave is not known to this day. So Moses and Elijah are very linked with each other. Um, and uh, everything that happens here we will see there is a resonance of Moses. And it happened as they crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken from you? So Elijah now changes his tune and it would seem that the previous three times are a kind of test. Is Elisha actually able to be the successor, the replacement of Elijah? And so three times he says, you don't have to come any further if you want. You could stay here. And he says, no, I'm going to come with you. And then twice more he asks that. And the third time he says, what can I do for you? Um, what is it uh, that uh, I may do before I am taken from you? Again, he uses that same language, I'm going to be taken. And Elisha said, let there be prey double portion of your spirit upon me. Yes, I love that. It's so bold, isn't it? He says, let me be twice as good as you. Um, I, I, I think it's very similar to that other great Carmelite, St. Therese of Lisieux, who describes in The Story of the Soul uh, when she and Céline uh, were offered some of their older sister's toys, uh, which they'd grown out of. And Céline very politely um, took one thing. And Therese just gathered all the rest of them up in her arms and said, sure, sure, see, choose. <laughs> I choose everything. Yes. And uh, I think that's what we're meant to do. And Therese said, you know, we, we should pray to be great saints. We should pray to be as great as St. Peter or St. Paul. And that's pretty bold, isn't it? But Elisha shows us the way. He says, let me have a double share, a double portion of your spirit. What does that actually mean? Well, there are two different interpretations of that. One is that he's twice as good as Elijah. And actually, 
there is a good biblical reason for thinking that Elijah works eight miracles. Elisha works 16 miracles. That's double. However, I think it's also fair to say that we cannot say that Elisha is as great as Elijah. Um, certainly, what we read about Elijah, both in the Old and New Testaments, indicates that he is, along with Moses, the um, most important prophet. And so another way of understanding that, if you um, read in um, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, earlier on in, in, in um, uh, I'm just sorry, trying to write, I did write this down. Uh, the, oh yes, in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17, uh, it tells us uh, that the oldest son would inherit a double portion meaning that, let's say, a father had 12 sons, um, the oldest one gets two portions and the rest get you know, one portion each. Um, and so if we think of Elijah as being the father of Elisha and all the other prophets, well, Elijah's going to get a double portion to which, to which everyone else has got. That's another way of thinking of it. Um, but certainly, Elisha makes a very bold request. And he said, Elijah said, you have asked a hard thing. If you see me taken from you, let it be thus for you. And if not, it will not be. Why does he have to see him? I think it's to do with that purity of intention. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Elisha has to keep focused, he has to keep watching. And if he does that, he will inherit his double portion. And it happened as they were going along speaking, that look, there was a chariot of fire, and horses of fire. And they separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to the heavens in a whirlwind. And Elisha was watching, and he was crying out, My father, my father, Israel's chariot and its horsemen. And he saw him not again. Just a couple of lines, such huge drama. But notice, Elisha was watching, and he saw why a chariot? Well, a chariot is sometimes um, a good description of, uh, of God's glory. So, for example, um, in Psalm uh, 67, uh, verse 17, we read, With mighty chariotry, twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands, the Lord came from Sinai into the holy place. So a chariot is seen as... That's God's vehicle. And fire, well, fire is obvious. Elijah is always, you know, he's a pyromaniac. Um, he brought down fire from heaven to um, consume the offerings on Mount Carmel. He brings down fire from heaven for the two groups of 50 uh, who were sent after him uh, by uh, King uh, Amaziah, ah ah Ahaziah. Um, fire is always what, what he is wanting, and so it's only fitting that he should go up to heaven in his chariot with fiery horses and fire chariot itself. Let's just look at a couple more pictures. Um, you can see here, this. If you think it looks like Matisse, then that's because Isaac Frenkel Frenel, who was a Jewish painter, painted this in 1940, he studied under Matisse in Paris. And um, look at that wonderful red of the horses and, and how they're, they're almost like they're swimming aren't they but they're, they're ascending to heaven and there's uh, Elijah in his fiery chariot behind them and then this is a, a, an engraving which just gives us the idea Elijah is our Johnson <laughs> 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 growing up in a wonderful kind of baroque pose and then 
here's a kind of children's picture. <laughs> this is probably, if you had a children's Bible, um, this is the sort of picture that you would have found in it. Um, go back to the previous one while I, while I say a bit more uh, about uh, what happens. So notice, Elijah, Elisha saw, he was watching, and he calls him my father. The relationship between Elisha and Elijah is that of son to father. Um, and we see that in the next verse. And he saw him not again, and he had clung to his garments and torn them in two. So there were lots of um, people for whom you might tear your garments. <coughs> in fact, often they had a little seam that could be sewn back up again because, you know, you keep sewing, tearing your garments and you want to be able to repair them. But there are some things, such as for the destruction of the temple, or um, uh, serious blasphemy, or the death of one's parents, where it was customary to tear your garments in two and not to repair them. And so Elisha is described as clinging to his garments and tearing them in two, which again indicates this father-son relationship between the two. And he lifted up Elijah's mantle, which had fallen from him. And he went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. And he took Elijah's mantle that had fallen from him. And he struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he too struck the water and it parted on both sides. And Elisha crossed over. So yes, the spirit has come upon him. And the mantle is not just an, an outward sign. It shows that the power, the spirit of both of them comes from God. It's not themselves working this, but the mantle is a sign. And so from, from now on, he will be clothed um, in the same mantle. Uh, and the acolyte prophets who were in Jericho saw him from the other side and said, Elijah's spirit has rested upon Elisha. So from now on, they're not going to be quite so cheeky to him because they've realised, actually, he's not just somebody that we might tell news to. The spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha. And indeed, that phrase, doesn't it, passing on the mantle, uh, taking on the mantle, um, we use uh, uh, habitually in English. I'm just going to, a little detour, because... We've said goodbye to Elijah, and it would be good to sum him up, and we can do that in the words of the book of Ecclesiasticus, the book of Sirach, which in chapter 48 says, Then the prophet Elijah arose like a fire, and his word burned like a torch. He brought down a famine upon them. And by his zeal he made them few in number. By the word of the Lord he shut up the heavens and also three times brought down fire. How glorious you were, O Elijah, in your wondrous deeds. And who has the right to boast which you have? You who raised a corpse from death and from Hades by the word of the Most High, who brought kings down to destruction and famous men from their beds, who heard rebuke at Sinai and judgments of vengeance at Horeb, who anointed kings to inflict retribution and prophets to succeed you. You who were taken up by a whirlwind of fire in a chariot with horses of fire. You who are ready at the appointed time it is written to calm the wrath of God before it breaks out in fury to turn the heart of the Father to the Son, to restore the tribes of Jacob. Blessed are those who saw you, and those who have been adorned in love, for we also shall surely live. It was Elijah who was covered by the whirlwind, and Elisha was filled with his spirit. In his, all his days he did not tremble before any ruler, and no one brought him into subjection. Nothing was too hard for him, and when he was dead, his body prophesied. We'll come on to Elisha later on. Um, 
and his extraordinary life. That's a very good summary of Elijah. Brings down fire from heaven three times. Raises the dead. So Elijah's going to do that twice. And even his dead body, in fact, will, will be life-giving. Um, but he has a kind of afterlife in, in the Bible. In that um, once he's disappeared, he becomes a figure who reappears. He actually writes a letter later on in the Book of Kings. Um, I won't spoil the story, but you know, he seems to have written a letter from beyond, beyond the skies. And in Jewish thought, of course, they so much stress the separation between God and the earth. But this was very troubling. How could Elijah be in heaven? Only God can be in heaven, properly speaking. And so uh, the sages often spoke of him as going in a kind of mid-air and he's dwelling up in the clouds and that's why, why he keeps turning up at circumcisions and Passovers and you always put out a seat for him. Um, though his character in later um, writings is much more gentle. You know, he, he appears to various uh, rabbinic figures and, and usually calms them down and, and says rather gentle things. Um, for us... Of course, Elijah has two significant functions after the end of his earthly life. He's gone up in his fiery chariot to heaven, um, and he kind of reappears uh, as a prefigurement of John the Baptist. So in um, the last of the prophets, the prophet Malachi, in um, chapter 4, the last chapter of Malachi, um, we read, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers, of children to their fathers, of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. And this is taken up, um, is quoted in the Gospels about John the Baptist. And then, of course, it is Moses and Elijah who appear on Mount Tabor at the Transfiguration in order to validate uh, the claims of Jesus in the eyes of the Apostles. So Elijah continues to be a significant figure. Meanwhile, Elisha has parted the Jordan. He's going back. So remember, we're, we're now um, we're going back up again. Uh, he's crossed the Jordan back into the Promised Land. Where is he going to go next? Um, well, there are these 50, um, the Acolyte prophets, and they say the spirit of Elijah has rested upon Elisha, and they came to meet him and bowed down before him to the ground. Elisha's going to work a lot of signs, and they're very important as giving him authority. And they said to him, Look, pray, your servants have 50 stalwart men, let them go pray and seek your master, lest the Spirit of the Lord has borne him off and flung him down on some hill or into some valley. So the acolyte prophets haven't really understood that he's gone permanently. Why do they not know this? Elisha saw, nobody else sees. And this will become apparent um, later on in the book of Kings. Um, when uh, in 2 Kings chapter 6 in um, verse 14 uh, there's a, um, another war against the Arameans and um, everybody thinks well you know we're certainly not going to win this because we're vastly outnumbered and Elisha says do not fear for there are more with us than with them and Elisha prayed and said Lord open his eyes pray that he may see and the Lord opened the lad's eyes, and he saw, and look, the mountain was filled with horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. So the Lord sends an army, and again, it's a chariot of fire, horses of fire. And they came down to him, and Elisha prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said, strike this nation with blinding light. So on that occasion, too, Elisha can see the Lord's armies. The lad with him can't, until he says, let him see him. He sees the hosts of the Lord, um, fiery chariots, fiery horses. And also, to be fair to the acolyte prophets, 
Um, do you remember when Obadiah uh, encountered Elijah earlier on? And he tells Obadiah, go and tell Ahab I'm here. And he says, me go and tell him you're here. And then what will happen? You'll go off in a whirlwind somewhere and, and, and we'll never see you again. So Elijah always already has this reputation um, for just kind of disappearing and, and, and being elusive. So the acolyte prophets think, well, you know, he's, he's gone off on one of his things and um, they will hunt around and he's probably landed somewhere. They've not really understood. Uh, and he said, you shall not send. And they urged him incessantly and he said, send. And they sent 50 men and sought him three days but did not find him. And they came back to him while he was staying in Jericho and he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? So it's rather sweet, isn't it? These acolyte prophets go on this great hunt and, and they come back and Elisha said, I told you. And the men of the town said to Elisha, look, pray, it is good to live in the town as my master sees, but the water is bad and the land bereaves. Which town is he in? Jericho. Why is Jericho uh, cursed with this bad water and death-giving land? Well, it's been cursed by Joshua. So remember, when Joshua destroys Jericho, he says, cursed be the man who rebuilds this town. He'll do so at the cost of his firstborn. Um, and so when the... Um, the city is rebuilt by Hiel, he does so at the cost of his firstborn, and that curse still holds. And so Elisha is now going to heal the town. He's going to take away the curse, which is why you can live in Jericho now. And he said, fetch me a new bowl and put salt in it. And they fetched it for him, and he went out to the water source and flung the salt there and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed these waters. There will no longer be death and bereaving. It's a, a very powerful sign and one that we still use today when holy water is blessed. You bless salt and you bless water, put the salt into the water and um, it the two together then become a sign of healing, of purity, um, and um, it's slightly counterintuitive because normally you wouldn't put salt in water uh, to make it fresh. Um, in fact, I suggest that you don't. Isn't that how people who are uh, you know shipwrecked and, and, and uh, in their, on their rafts at sea they go mad drinking salt water? Um, it's a counter sign, rather like. Um, at the waters of uh, Marah when Moses flings the tree into the water in Exodus chapter 16, eight, chapter 15, and that purifies the water. You wouldn't normally throw a tree into water to purify it, but this is what happens. Um, and you notice also that Moses does that three days after they've crossed through the Red Sea. So in the same way, Three days after Elisha has struck the Jordan with uh, Elijah's mantle and it parts and then he arrives at Jericho and he performs again the sign of purifying waters. Another link is if you think of the, um, the fiery serpents who were biting the people and then Moses makes a bronze serpent which when they look at they are healed. Uh, so in the same way death becomes a sign of life and ultimately that will um, happen on the cross. So again, we see who Elisha is by this sign. And the waters have been healed to this day according to the word of Elisha that he spoke. So, so far, Elisha's doing the very, very good job. However, we now come to one of the more troubling aspects of um, Elisha's ministry. Let's go two slides ahead if we could. 
for the seat lad. Here we have, oh, you missed this one. This is another, this is a contemporary Eastern Orthodox icon. So it's quite fun. You've got the uh, mantle falling down there and the fiery chariots, fiery horsemen. One further again. Oh, so let's see what's happened. And he went from there to Bethel. So going up again. And as he was coming up on the road, young lads came out from the town and jeered at him and said to him, Away with you, Baldy! Away with you, Baldy! <laughs> there they are, the young lads, red dog, and they say, Oi, Baldy! Why is he bald? Well, maybe he's just bald. Um, contrast with Elijah, who was a hairy man. Possibly he's shaved his head as a sign of mourning. Uh, we don't know. But anyway, these boys think it's very funny. This is by Rolf van Ziel, um, a 17th century painter. Um, we don't actually see Elijah in the picture. We just see the cheeky boys pointing at him and sticking their tongues out of there. Next slide. And here we have um, from a, a, a medieval manuscript. There's Elijah looking very serene <laughs> going up into heaven. And here are all these, these boys, and we'll we get to see what happens to them here. And he turned round behind him and saw them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the forest and ripped apart 42 boys. And he went from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he came back to Samaria. This is a bit troubling, isn't it? Elisha, you know, just because uh, he doesn't say, oh, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words shall never hurt me. He says, you're cursed. And immediately these two bears come and rip apart 42 of them. How do we justify this? Should not, A, Elisha have been much more careful about using the curse, which he knows is powerful. He knows he has a double spirit of Elijah. He knows he has the spirit of Elijah that will part the Jordan when he curses these boys. He must know that something terrible is going to happen. And though we might say, yes, it's very bad to mock prophets, nevertheless, if these are just boys, um, couldn't he have let it go? Um, before I try and give an explanation that might send us away happier, Let's just look at this um, marvellous picture. Uh, oh no, but, yeah, so there's, uh, there's the bears at the top ripping apart the boys and there they are mocking Elisha. And this is probably uh, the best known of the pictures by Wilhelm Wilhelms van den Bundel. Um, and actually the landscape and the church there and, and the trees is the main thing, but down at the bottom you see the boys, you see Elisha, he is bored, and there you see the bears and the boys fleeing. Um, or you might want to imagine it like this. <laughs> this is the cartoon version. <laughs> the ferocious bears and Elisha looking very pleased with himself. There. Or, his hair's growing back. His hair's growing back, yes. Mm -hmm. Or this is rather because he looks like an Tolkien character and he's having jolly nice time watching all these little boys being ripped apart by bears there. Uh, they're kind of um, difficult to, uh, to reconcile. And one more. <laughs> they look as though they're saying, yikes! <laughs> now, two things. Well, Robert Alter says they're torn apart. Some other translators say they're mauled, so they're not necessarily killed by the bears. Even so, I think, you know, anyone who, who, whose children were mauled by bears would want to get to the bottom of who caused this. Uh, and they'd say, what, well, you had them mauled by bears just because they were cheeky? It does seem a little bit of an overreaction. So people try to come up with different explanations one thing you can say is if 42 boys are mauled by two she-bears, there must have been a lot more boys because surely uh, some of them would have got away. So in fact, it seems perhaps it's the whole town uh, uh, comes out to, to mock him. 
And by mocking him, they know that he's got the spirit of Elijah. They're directly contradicting God's will. And there's another thing we can say as well. The word, um, Robert Alter translates it as boys here. It could also be translated as lads. And it's the same word, na, that's used for children, but also actually in the way that you might talk about lads or even servants. So, for example, earlier in the first book of Kings, after Solomon's death, when his son Rehoboam comes to the throne, he consults the old men and they say, be a bit softer. And then he goes away and he con consults the Naveen, the lads who've grown up with him. And they must be at least 40 years old. So they're still described as the lads. You know, like somebody might say, I'm going on a boy's night out. And actually, they, they're not necessarily a boy. Um, so it can be used in quite an extensive way. And where is he when this happens? Bethel. What happens in Bethel? Remember, Jeroboam sets up in Bethel a golden calf. So these lads are not little children. They are the pro prophets or the priests or the acolytes of idolatry. And in mocking Elisha, they are rebelling against God. They are actually attacking God's anointed one prophet Elisha. So in fact, they're not just innocent bystanders who, you know, um, uh, call something out for a lark. Uh, it's a very def definite idolatrous thing that they're saying. So um, that way we can explain it a bit more. Um, although the text might indicate that actually the, the, the lads are from Jericho when he's on the way to Bethlehem. But at least that's one explanation that we can find for this um, troubling event. Uh, it became a, almost a, a, a sort of saying later on uh, that um, the, the rabbis who wanted to um, soften what happened here um, said there, there was neither forest nor bears. And it became always a, a, a saying when you told a tall story and you say, yeah, there was neither forest nor bears. Um, so uh, they were trying to allegorise it. Um, why were um, there two bears? The Portuguese um, Jewish commentator uh, from the 15th century, Arabanel, says two bears, one for the honour of Elijah and one for the honour of Elisha. Because by calling out, go up, you baldy, uh, they're actually attacking both of them at that time. We will stop there. And next time, we'll hear some more of those amazing miracles that Elisha does. And many of them will sound very familiar. Because in the Gospels, our Lord repeats many of the signs that Elisha works. So that they become a way of showing who he is. And of um, uh, showing that he too has the spirit resting upon him. Um, so we will move on to that next time which will be the last time before Christmas uh, and uh, you'll notice if you looked at the poster that we've fallen hopelessly behind because I've talked too much about each chapter but I think it is better to go a bit more slowly and especially today we couldn't really have done more than one chapter. I pray thee loving Jesus that as thou hast graciously given me to drink in with delight the words of thy knowledge so thou wouldst mercifully grant me to attain one day to thee fountain of all wisdom, and to appear forever before thy face. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.